This is a Reconstructionist radio production. Please visit GaryNorth.com slash free books to download this book in PDF format. By This Standard The Authority of God's Law Today by Greg L. Bonson Published by the Institute for Christian Economics, Tyler, Texas Copyright 1985 Chapter 19 What the Law Cannot Do Quote, the law could not accomplish the remission of sins, but only witness to its coming reality. End quote. We have seen that even the good law of God can become an evil thing when abused, when put to a use which is contrary to its character and purpose. It will prove beneficial to try and summarize just what the law cannot do in itself, so that we might not fall into the error of using the law unlawfully. 1. In the first place, as discussed just previously, the law cannot contribute anything toward the personal justification of one who stands under its curse for violating its precepts. Before the standard of God's law, the sinner will always stand condemned rather than being judged righteous. Quote, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. End quote. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Those who hope to find acceptance with God on the basis of their own good deeds cannot find his favor. Quote, you have been discharged from Christ, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. End quote. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. The very attempt to gain justification in this manner is futile. For, quote, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. End quote. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. 2. Nor can the law break the stranglehold and power of sin in a person's life. The principle of Christ's life-giving spirit set Paul free from the principle of sin and death. Thus he said, quote, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son, condemned sin, in order that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled by us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. End quote. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. By the flesh, Paul means the sinful nature within man, which is at war with God and rebellious against his righteous standards. Verses 6 through 8. The law of God simply could never overthrow the sinful nature and bring about conformity to its pattern of righteousness. The law could not empower obedience and put a decisive end to the power of disobedience. The law could show what was right, but the faulty character of the sinner prevented the right from being performed. In the face of this failing, the law was helpless to amend the situation. However, God did condemn sin and destroy its dreadful power by sending his own Son to save sinners. The Son supplied his Spirit to believers to give them the enabling power of obedience to the law. Where they were once impotent, they are now empowered. We must ever remember that the law is a pattern only. It cannot supply the power to follow the pattern. Paul elsewhere expressed this truth by saying, quote, you are not under law, but under grace, end quote. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. The person who is under law is one whose resources and powers are determined exclusively by the law. The context of Paul's declaration is the key to understanding it correctly. Being under law takes a parallel position to having sin reign within oneself. Romans chapter 6, verse 12. To sin having dominion over oneself, verse 14a. To being servants of sin, verse 17. Instead of being under law and by its impotence enslaved to sin, Paul sees the believer as under grace instead, that is, under the determining power of God's merciful and mighty work of salvation. This grace makes one over into a servant of righteousness and obedience. Romans chapter 6 verse 13 and 16 through 18. One is now under the enabling power of God's grace, just so that one can obey the previously transgressed law of God. This conception of Paul's meaning helps us to see his declaration's appropriate place and function in its local context. In its full form, Paul's point is this, quote, Sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under law but under grace. What then shall we sin since we are under grace and not under law? God forbid. Romans chapter 6 verses 14 through 15. In context, it is clear that being under law is a position of powerlessness, wherein the bondage to sin remains unbroken, whereas being under grace supplies the spiritual strength to break off from sinning and now to obey the righteous standards of God found in his law.
3. Finally, it is important to remember that the law delivered by Moses never could actually make anything perfect. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 19. While it beautifully foreshadowed the saving ministry of Jesus Christ in its ceremonial enactments, the law could never by its repeated sacrifices secure the eternal redemption needed by God's people. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 through 12 and chapter 10 verses 1 through 12. Only the coming of the promised Savior, his atoning death, and justifying resurrection could accomplish the hoped for salvation of believers. The law could not accomplish the remission of sins, but only witness to its coming reality. Accordingly, the ceremonial portion of the Old Testament law was never meant to be literally followed forever in the same manner as it was by Old Testament saints. It was imposed until the time of Reformation. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 10. With the coming of the Savior, the shadows are left behind. The ceremonial system is put out of gear and made inoperative. To insist on keeping those ordinances in the same way as did the Old Testament believers would be to disclose in oneself a legalistic attitude toward salvation. Galatians chapter 4 verses 8 through 10 and chapter 5 verses 1 through 6. It would be retrogressive and disdainful of Christ to whom the Old Testament ceremonies pointed under law. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, Paul describes himself as not being myself under the law. Even though he became to the Jews as one who was under the law in order that he might win some Jews to Christ. In the next verse, he continues to describe himself now as, quote, not being without law to God, but under law to Christ, end quote. If nothing else, this verse refutes any idea that Romans chapter 6, verse 14, quote, you are not under law, but under grace, end quote can be interpreted as implying that the person under grace has been released from moral obligation to the law of God. Paul affirms his submission to the law of Christ, and thereby to every detail of the Old Testament law as well. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. Indeed, he was not at all without the law of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 31, chapter 7, verse 22, and chapter 8, verse 4. What then does he mean when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, that he is not under the law? It would appear that this expression, under law, is not being used in the same manner in both Romans 6, 14 and 1 Corinthians 9, 20. In the former passage, it implies bondage to the power of sin, and this is far from what Paul is saying about himself in the latter passage. Those enslaved to sin are lawless, but Paul unmistakably asserts that he is not without God's law in Christ. The phrase under law in Romans 6.14 applies indiscriminately to all unbelievers, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, it applies to only one category of unbelievers, while without law describes the remaining category of unbelievers. What then does Paul mean in 1 Corinthians 9.20 by asserting that he himself is not under the law? Paul is showing how he became all things to all men for the sake of the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. Quote, to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain Jews. End quote. Verse 20. When with them he acted as though under the law, even though with others he acted as though without the law. Does scripture help us understand how Paul was not thereby acting inconsistently, immorally, and with duplicity? Yes, it does. The unbelieving Jews had not recognized as yet the dramatic change brought in by the redemptive realities of the New Testament. Although Christ had realized all that the Mosaic ceremonial law had anticipated, unbelieving Jews continued to follow these rituals. In dealing with such men, Paul accommodated himself to these customs to gain a hearing for the gospel, even though he fully knew that they were not in themselves obligatory any longer. The shadows had given way to the Savior. For instance, Paul would carry out purification rites, for example, Acts chapter 21, verses 20 through 26, and take certain vows, for example, Acts chapter 18, verse 18, which he knew to be morally indifferent, and he did so to preserve a hearing for the gospel among the Jews. Among the Gentiles, however, he behaved as though without the law. There was no advantage to pursuing the ceremonies in their presence. They were not like the Jews in this respect, not, quote, kept in ward under the law before faith came, end quote, end quote, under a tutor, end quote, until arriving at maturity of sons, such as New Testament believers, who enjoy freedom from that tutor of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 26.
The Jews lived under the ceremonial rituals handled down by Moses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, Paul, recognizing that these rituals could not actually accomplish salvation and that they were rendered inoperative by the atoning work of Christ, says that, nevertheless, he acted as though under law in order to gain the Jews for Christ. With some men, he conformed to these rites, but with others he did not. He was all things to all men, without ever losing sight of the fact that he was in law to Christ, and thus not at all failing to submit to God's law. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.